Guacamole on the black sheep. Think how to track guacamole on the black sheep. Edward, come on up. Edward Honor. Okay, so I brought a prop. Um, this is guacamole. There's really nothing overly um, unique about this guacamole. Where's the clicker? Uh, uh, Andy, Eric, just take the I can wing it usually pretty good, but I, I, I do I need this. Clicker, so. Okay. So. Okay, so this is the guacamole I brought. There's nothing really overly unique about this guacamole other than it is guacamole that's on the watching. And so when you walk into the grocery store and you see something that you buy, you don't always think about where it came from. So in this case, the one pound package of guacamole started out as a 455 pound batch of guacamole. And that one pound back batch of guacamole also became eight ounce packaging, 16 ounce packaging, three pound packaging, it was also shipped to wholesalers who put it in their own package and sell it as their own grocery store guacamole. Um, it sold to manufacturers who take the guacamole, they put it in sandwiches and salads. And so there's a lot that goes on with that package of guacamole or that batch of guacamole. So when you look at it, before it's guacamole, it's onions, it's tomatoes, it's avocados. Those same ingredients are also used in other products that are made by the same company. So. These onions might also make it into some salsa that gets shipped. And it ends up going to a lot of different places, and it ends up at your grocery store, it ends up in your sandwich, and it ends up a lot of places you don't know where it's going to go. So a couple times a year or one time a year, something always goes wrong. There's always going to be something that's unexpected. So let's say you get your supplier calls you and says, um, those onions we shipped you yesterday, we need to be recalled. Well, the problem is they're not onions anymore. They're salsa, they're guacamole. They, they left your chain of custody, they went somewhere else and they became part of a sandwich. So even though you turned it into guacamole or salsa, they turned it into a sandwich and now you need to recall it. Now this happens more often than it should happen. And it's one of the big problems in the food services industry and it's also a big problem in a lot of different industries. So how big is this a problem? Well, every year, 48 million Americans get sick in my food for Globally, over 600 million people are affected by this. And so this is a problem that actually causes a huge economic loss. Between 55 and $90 billion in economic loss comes from the inefficient tracking of recalls. If, if I have to recall this onion and I don't know where the onions went, I have to recall everything. So there's been a lot of high, um, high visibility recalls, um, and that's one of the reasons that this is becoming something that people are getting interested in. So this is not just a problem for food, it's also a problem for Manufacturing devices, which parts go into manufacturing devices. So it looks like there is definitely a market for traceability. Now, I'll be probably the fourth or fifth person to say something along these lines that if today, that if you need to change the definition of blockchain to fit your use case, don't go any further. If blockchain isn't right for what you want to do, don't use the blockchain. There's plenty of other good technologies out there. I've been a developer for 30 years. I've seen amazingly great technologies that you could use instead of blockchain for a lot of things. So it, there's four scenarios that we need to look at for traceability to determine if we want to use it on the blockchain. <clears throat> this is the first one. This is the most common one. This is a package that gets divided up into smaller packages and shipped to a lot of different locations. This is kind of your lettuce example, where the lettuce starts out as lettuce on the farm, ends up as lettuce in a lot of different places. The second scenario is transfer and manufacture. So I've got my tomatoes, my avocado, or avocados, but I still have to track them. So in order for the blockchain to be a useful solution for traceability, it needs to be able to handle this scenario. And then the third scenario is the farm scenario. Okay, farming, ranching, building something, it's creating an asset over time. So we have, uh, 
I, I know cattle ranchers, okay, and they do a lot of things with their cattle over the life of the cattle before it turns into, before it's sold off to um, a broker. So keeping track of the things that you do as you create this asset over time, and that leads to storing something on the immutable ledger of things like certificates of analysis, assay certificates, those are things that you might want to store, and you need to know later that that certificate of authenticity wasn't forged. So that's another scenario that you want to be able to do in food traceability. So, so everybody talks all the time about what the blockchain provides. The blockchain provides transparency, it provides trust. There's always a lot of buzzwords that go along with the blockchain. It's a distributed ledger, secure transfer of assets. Protected, protected by cryptography, and it all really comes down to Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 in his original white paper. So if we're looking at using blockchain for traceability, the thing behind it is actually part of the original blockchain. It's called unspent transaction output. It is the mechanism that is used to solve the double spend problem. And a lot of people don't realize this, and a lot of people who are running this Silk Road found out about it the hard way. Traceability is built into the blockchain. Um, the, me the mechanism that makes for a useful cash transfer system also creates traceability. Because as part of the original definition of a blockchain, a coin is actually a chain of digital, uh, digital signatures. And if you if you know my Ethereum wallet address, you could go into Etherscan and you can see all the places I ever got Ethereum from, anybody who's ever sent me Ethereum. You can actually trace the Ethereum all the way back to the miners that created it. If I send Ethereum to any of you, I can find out what you did with that Ethereum after I sent it to it. So for a financial system, this kind of traceability isn't necessarily the best thing that you want. And there's a lot of um, technologies that have been built since Bitcoin in order to hide traceability. But the original, the original UTXO is actually a great tool for traceability. So this is kind of what, what it looks like. Your, your miner, every coin that's in a, a public blockchain, a public cryptocurrency, was created by a miner. And then it's been transferred since then to the wallet that it's currently in. So since with the 2009 blockchain solution, um, traceability is a series of inputs, and so is the blockchain. So the, the reason I'm standing up here is because I'm a big person who is into building platforms. And if you want to build a platform for either yourself or other people to build traceability applications, what, do you, what does your platform need in order to be successful? So first of all, it needs to be available to everyone in the supply chain. A cattle rancher has a different need for traceability solutions than a food manufacturer, than a shipping company, than a distributor, than the end retailer. So there's different requirements all the way across the supply chain. But for it to be something that's useful, um, our original design said that the, the ability to transfer assets across applications needs to be built into the, into the platform and applications need to work together and not in silos. If any of you have ever built uh, distributed applications for Ethereum, your application sits on the Ethereum platform, but it doesn't talk to anybody else. When we developed our platform, we realized we needed to build a platform where if you were um, creating an application for the cattle rancher, the cattle rancher is gonna sell his beef to a distributor, those, those just like in the original blockchain, those applications need to be able to talk to each other and not operate in silos. And then it must work for all traceability use cases. So it kind of looks like something like this. Anything with food, you create it, you transfer it, you transform it, and you transfer it again. So in the architecture that we developed, we realized that we wanted to do this on a public blockchain. And the reason for being a public blockchain had nothing to do with security. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blockchain purist going all the way back to the beginning. If you look at the trusted code base inside of, a, inside of a cryptocurrency, it is secure, especially when you're um, protecting with proof of work. And wallets are one of those things that people never give enough credit to. Everybody likes to talk about contracts, but that's not the um, Transactions on the blockchain. 
blockchain is another architecture that can be employed by the blockchain as an alternative to smart contracts. So, let me fast forward here. So we had a vision for developing a platform. We wanted to have a public blockchain platform that supported traceability features. Now when I talk about traceability features, and I talk about tracing onions, I don't care if you got the best price for the onions, I don't care how you bought the onions, I want to know that if somebody eats those onions and gets sick, within seconds we can find all the places those onions have ever been, and what other products, even if they're out of your chain of custody, are holding those onions. So we wanted to build an ecosystem. I'm a big, to a certain extent, I'm a huge fan of Ethereum. I think the way that the Ethereum uses gas, it allows people to build their own applications that they can run on the Ethereum platform, allows them to build their own business, out there like Amazon. Amazon made a ton of money just by selling books, but they enabled other people to build, to sell things on their platform. If you look at that, that was kind of our vision for the platform. Now this title of this slide is actually sarcasm. I just, I learned that sarcasm does not come across really well on the slide. When you say mission complete with blockchain, it's never mission complete. It's just your mission transforms from one mission to another. So on, um, in July, we launched the traceability blockchain, which we started with clients. We've got guacamole, we've got bread, we've got sauce, we've got all these different products. We make a, a deodorant um, it's on the blockchain. And then we decided to move that over to a public blockchain on, in, on September 17th. So we forked CryptoNote, which if you're familiar with the Monero, you understand the Monero platform, and we built a hybrid blockchain. So on October 1st, we did a Bitcoin talk announcement and then the mayhem just began. Okay, and when I say the mayhem began, we had people, we had 300 miners mining the coin within the first 72 hours. There were mining pools that popped up out of nowhere. We didn't, couldn't figure out where these people came from. We also couldn't figure out how quickly they were able to build mining pools to mine a coin that we had just launched 72 hours ago. So we would actually gotten up to the point of, of two mega hashes per second. Um, we're currently on like block uh, 50,000. If you're not a cryptocurrency person, none of this impresses you. But if you are a cryptocurrency person, um, we are we were amazed at what happened when you put it out there. So there's been a lot of these presentations have talked about, they've talked about testing and they've talked about just doing it, they've talked about innovation and invention. I say in here, don't, do, don't try this at home, but the reality is do try it at home. Because you don't know what you don't know until you actually go out and do it. We didn't know about, enough about traceability until we got traceability clients. We didn't know about private blockchain until we built a private blockchain. We sure didn't know what was gonna happen with a public blockchain until we actually launched it and people started getting on there. So we did the entire thing completely out of order. Um, we launched the platform before we raised any money because I'm actually a developer and I have a lot of resources, developer resources, and we had salespeople who could go out and sell it. So we launched the entire thing out of order. We just threw it out there to see what would happen. Now we threw it out there a month ago and it's been very exciting since. And uh, actually that's why I'm talking about this today. Um, we have our roadmap of next steps. We're making it up as we go along. I love a FinTech conference because it's something that we absolutely know nothing about. We actually have a coin that we launched and we didn't know anything about how to sell coins. We have um, 300 miners out there mining the coin, but we're not on an exchange. And at some point here, the miners are gonna force us to be on an exchange. Um, there's just a lot of things you can do in blockchain and I recommend you just, just go out and do it. And if you fail, worst thing you do is you fork your code and start all over again. Thank you. <laughs>